Britain's railways are about to go through some major reforms, most notably the creation of a new public sector body, Great British Railways, to operate and maintain all trains, stations and tracks in Great Britain. It won't be entirely nationalised though. Most services will still be run by private companies, just GBR will tell them how to run it, and all profits will go to GBR, and all losses will go to them as well. The private companies will just be paid a set amount each month. Now it's certainly debatable about whether the privatisation of British Rail in the 1990s was a good idea. However, regardless of your conclusions, it can be agreed, hopefully, that change was necessary. All that said though, we do not want a repeat of British Railways. For all its benefits, it did lead to a closure of large swathes of the network, and arguably reduced the quality of service. So, what has been done to prevent such an outcome, and what would I do to prevent one? Now, I'm no economist, so looking at the figures would probably mean I'd get something drastically wrong. But we can still analyse the design. Again, I'm no artist, but I think I can appreciate good design where I find it. And well, I mean, who cares if I'm not qualified? I'm going to say my thoughts anyway. Let's start with what they've planned already. There's no clear livery, but we do have a logo. Well, according to this independent article. If this is really the actual Great British Railways logo, then what on earth were they thinking? It looks needlessly messy, quite ugly, brash, not very pleasant at all. I don't understand what was so wrong with the National Rail logo of just red. It was clean and iconic, and memorable enough. To create patriotism, you don't have to plaster the Union Jack everywhere. You just have to create good public systems that people will be proud of. Take the NHS, for example. There are no flags to be seen in the logo, yet the institution is valued massively by the British public. We've also got a few instances of the station signage design. I think it's all right, perhaps a bit bland. All right, we're getting ahead of ourselves. The William Shapps Review in 2020 first detailed Great British Railways. I think it did a very good job at identifying the key areas for improvement. I also applaud how it highlighted that we shouldn't just replicate British Rail. Generally, the report was very, very good and set out some fantastic ideas and values. But there's been something on my mind. The brands of railway companies and regions are quite historic and unique. They also make things quite interesting for transporters, but I'm completely not affected by that in any way at all. Definitely. You know what I mean, though. It would be a shame to lose a lot of cultural significance. Well, fear not, as I found this clause. Well, didn't find it, it was in like the first paragraph. Nonetheless, the <laughs> Well, fear not, as in the first paragraph, it mentions regional sub-identities. So, what will these regional sub-identities look like, and how will they be formed? Well, we could have something like the existing network rail region system. Of course, open access operators would retain their brand identities, and staff for organisations like London Overground or Mersey Rail would stay more or less exactly as they are now. I think a system like this would retain a lot of cultural significance, whilst also improving brand simplicity and making things a lot easier to understand for the passenger. Now, this would require a nationwide livery design, just with different colours for the regions. I think maybe we should follow the example of the original British Railways colours, as in sort of Express Blue and GWR Brown and so on. As for what the standardised livery could look like, I think maybe something like the EMR livery. I mean, I know they obviously wouldn't use the livery of a private operator, but nonetheless, I think it's quite suitable for the role. It goes with most colours, and it feels traditional but also modern. But there was another part of the report that caught my eye. In Chapter 5, it says, Great British Railways will introduce new design and ride standards that will make sure all new trains are more comfortable than their predecessors. I wonder what those new design and ride standards will be. Hmm. Anyhow, Great British Railways will bring forward the normal replacement cycles on existing trains equipped with ironing board-like seats, beginning with long-distance trains, and they will eventually remove them altogether. Okay, that's interesting. Well, first of all, the fire safety regulation determining the thickness of seats must be changed. It doesn't really have much relevance, and whilst that may sound insensitive and reckless, very few incidents have been caused by seats spontaneously combusting or at least transferring flame one to another. Secondly, 
There'll need to be different specifications for different modes of transport. Obviously, you couldn't fit an intercity-style interior to a commuter train. That just wouldn't be practical. I can presume that there will probably be about three different types. There'd be the urban, which would probably be something like 2 plus 2 interior with no tables but lots of standback room. Maybe something like the class 701, just except with no ironing board seats. And then maybe there'd be regional with 2 plus 2 seating, comfortable seats, tables and lots of legroom at airline bays. I don't know if this would include first class. It might, but then again it might not. I don't know whether first class would on the whole be expanded upon or withdrawn. If it were to be retained, I think it's crucial that it's consistent in how it's provided, where it's provided, and the passenger experience, regardless of length of train or importance of route. It seems that in recent years there's been a bit of a trend for disguising 2 plus 2 seating as first class. It's not. I think the Enks Greater Anglia class 170s are a good example of how to do it. Despite being just two coaches long, they have a comfortable, but small, section of first class, with large 2 plus 1 seats, lamps on tables, curtains, and a dividing door between the first class section and second class. This is how to do it. Furthermore, if a trolley is provided on the route, snacks can be offered complimentary to first class passengers. A lot of people are quite objectionable to the idea of first class, but I think it's important to acknowledge that there are people travelling for business, as well as many other things that may require an upper class of travel. I think it's important that we do provide a luxury method of transport, as the only other alternative would be to go by car. These people are still going to travel in luxury anyway, we might as well make them do it by train. And finally, there would of course be intercity interiors. These would, as to be expected, be very comfortable with large seats, lots of leg room, reading lights and so on. First class would also make, be made sure to be an excellent experience, with full catering provided for first class passengers, complimentary on every weekday service. It's important to remember that food matters. We could base the regional interiors on a sort of modernised class 170, and the intercity interiors on perhaps a severely overhauled class 800, or maybe a pendolino. But um, there we are. A small video to talk about some of the ideas that Great British Railways could maybe implement to improve the passenger experience and overall design of the British Railway Network. And thank you very much for watching. I'd just like to say I'm very sorry about how long this video took, considering it's quite small, but there will be a very good video coming up, and an even better one after that. Let's just say, um, Purple Train. <laughs>